Hello everybody, I'm Wally with Darkroom Software and today this is the first in our series of uh, virtual workshops that we're doing uh, as a result of the social distancing that's going on. I hope everybody's safe, doing well, and uh, you know have a, has a little time to uh, learn a little bit more about Darkroom and improve your skills. I'm coming to you today not from our regular offices but from our top secret alternate command post my office at home. So uh, everybody just sit back and take a look. This first video is going to be, or this first live video, is going to be about Darkroom Booth Basic. Now before people who've been around for a while just dismiss that, you may want to just sit in and watch because you may learn something that you didn't know. Most people do. They find out something that, hey, I didn't know that did that. So everybody just sit tight and let's take a look at uh, Darkroom Booth Basic. All right, here is the uh, basic darkroom booth. When you first open the software, this is sort of what you would see. Uh, I'm going to point to a few things and hope you can see my mouse pointer. But over on this far left hand side, you'll see a list of events. And of course, I've created some here that are not in the sample events, but these are all for various uh, demos that I'm going to be doing throughout this. So these are our list of events. And up at the top is a drop down menu that you can do different things. This is a, a large menu that you can use with a Surface Pro or touch screen that makes it easier to touch. All of these things are also available if you just simply right click uh, on the, uh, the mount or the uh, item itself. So if you look here, uh, first of all, I'm going to click back up here so they're big. Uh, you can create a new event, you can duplicate an event, you can remove an event, lock an event hide events or get help. A lot of times people will say, well, how can I find out how to get help in the software? Well, it's this big help icon right here. You just click on that and it takes you to our knowledge base where you can find out information. Now, let's take a look at one of these or each of these individually. First of all, create a new event is pretty obvious. If you're just going to start with a, an event from scratch, you can just click right there. Duplicate event, what I recommend people do, we're going to talk a little bit about event management, but what I re recommend people do is they create a certain series of their own standard events, the things that you plan to offer. So you may have one that is just simply a, a two by six photo strip print only, one that maybe is no print but uh, email and text or something like that. So you have an event that's that way. And then you, once you get all those things worked out and how you want to offer it, then you use this feature right here to lock that event. And I'll show you how that works. If I click on lock event, you'll see how all the controls now over in the center screen grayed out. What that does for you is it lets this event stay standard. It doesn't let you make any accidental changes in the event. Now it's not password protected anything, so all you would do is click back up here and choose unlock an event and then now you can see everything is not grayed out anymore. But it gives you an opportunity to create several standard events on your um, darkroom booth and then lock those so they can't accidentally get changed. Then once you do that, all you do is select the event and then click duplicate an event. Now when you click duplicate an event, then it comes up and, and gives it a new name, Sample Beach Theme 1 in this particular case. It just adds a 1 or a 2 after it. But if you double click on it, then you can change the name to whatever you want so that you can, um, you know, let's say you're going to do a wedding for Bob and Marcy. So you select the stock event that you've created that would be the type of event that they're going to use. And then you duplicate it and then you double click and change that to Bob and Marcy's wedding, put in their information. And then that way, uh, you're not touching or altering your original event. You're keeping the original event as it is, the sample event. Um, then you can use that however you like and be able to um, alter it, change the template, whatever you need to for that specific event. Now, if you need to remove an event, it is never a good idea because Darkroom Booth has all sorts of uh, data files and things that it tracks the various events, the best thing to do is not delete it from outside of Darkroom. 
You don't want to go into Windows to the X drive or anything else and delete that event. You want to do that from right here. So you can choose this menu and click remove event or you can right click. So if I do that, then it's going to come up with this message right here. It says, are you sure you want to remove this event? Now, there's also a checkbox if you look right there that says delete picture files as well. It's a sort of uh, get out of jail free card. If someone accidentally clicked on that and then clicked remove, it removes the event, but it doesn't remove the images. So you've got that, you know, as a, as a backup that you can get back those images. But if you click delete the pictures as well, then it's going to take and remove that completely and uh, and you won't have access to those images anymore so that's a three-step process to remove those so it should be uh, you know really not really easy to do accidentally and that's the whole idea so back up here again we have height events if you're using a vertical monitor like a mirror booth or something then this wide screen format can sometimes get in the way uh, take up some real estate. So if you just don't need to see those events, you can click hide events and you'll see it just moves the, um, the menu over here on the left out of the way so that you don't see it anymore. You can right click show events and it's back. You can also drag and move this around a little bit, but there's a minimum size so you can make it bigger, but a minimum size doesn't let you make it too much smaller. So that's the event menu over here on the left hand side. Now let's move on over here to the right right hand side and uh, take a look at some of our uh, options in the drop down menus. So in this particular view there are, if you click on the settings, you'll see this big drop down menu. Again, big icons for use on a Surface Pro with a touch screen. On the extreme left you'll see global settings, output queue, and again the help icon. Global settings are things that apply to all events. We'll talk about that a little bit later but the output queue is something that you can use. If you click on that, you'll see here various things that are in process of completion. So you can see I don't have a printer turned on, so these things are waiting. These are some, some uh, test events that I did or test sessions I did. If you right click on that, you'll pop up and you'll see the things that are included in that particular session. In this case, a 4x6 and a slideshow. If there were an email or something else, it would show down there. When these things are completed, then they'll move over to this completed jobs. And then you can also click right here and see what was in that completed job. So that's how you can see what's done, what's waiting to be done. Uh, sometimes people will call us or email us and say, help, I've got all these test events or test sessions that I did that are printing out and I, I turned on the printer and now they're printing out. All you have to do is go here and click delete all print jobs. So if I do that, it's going to wipe out all those print jobs. So that way it'll stop it and keep that from sending all those to the printer. So if you click up here at the top where it says back to events, we go back to our main screen. Um, Let's talk first of all, again, I'm going to go back here just to this. So we'll, we'll go over all of these in just a minute. Those are the, all the various tabs that you can go to within the software, the various areas. But on the left of that, there are two things you'll see right here. And uh, one of those, let me get to the, my test event here. So one of these is called the Prints tab. Prints tab would be the output. That's the thing that you printed. That's the thing that it's darkroom booth is putting out. And then next to that is the Photos tab. Photos tab would be the actual camera photos, the things from the camera, the un unedited photos just right out of the camera. And from here, up here at the top, you'll see this drop down menu. From there, you can remove them. You can get some information about them. You can copy or burn those out to a thumb drive or something. You can also uh, show the print queue and everything from right here. So that's some things you can do within the Photos tab. If you click on the Prints tab, you'll see the actual output. And one thing that a lot of people misunderstand is this section here, the output, these are not flat file JPEGs. These are similar in, in scope to a, um, a Photoshop layered file. So in this view right here, this is the Prints tab. If I double click on one, it opens in an editor. And from there, you can actually See how I'm moving that photo? I'm doing that with my mouse wheel. So if I move the photo or move the mouse wheel, it adjusts and changes. You can also drag that around and, and uh, change the composition of that as well. So those are all things that you can do from in this, this Prints tab. You can double click here on the, the uh, 
wording and you can change that, correct it if you have a mistake or something. And then you can also, if you want to, you can come over here and adjust the, uh, the exposure and make an exposure adjustment in the photos. So if you've ever done this for very long, you may have at some point in time had an event where the pictures are too dark or something. Maybe the attendant wasn't paying attention or something. And in that particular case, you could actually go here and correct them and re-output them. So I'm going to click cancel and get back out of that. Go back to the main menu here. So this is our output tab. This is where you determine what output is going to happen with Darkroom Booth. So first of all, the latest version, if you don't have the latest version, you won't see this feature. I say the latest version, it was uh, actually released at PBX last year. So this match output section, here's where you would choose how many photos are going to be taken. Now once upon a time, you had to actually select the correct number to get the right number, but then we added this match output. If you choose the match output, then it will base how many photos are actually taken based on the template selected. It also works with print alternate if you're letting people choose different templates. So you could have a, a three photo template, a one photo template, and whichever one they choose, it will take the correct number of photos. So over on the right hand side, you'll see how the camera is turned. That's usually a set it and forget it setting. So however your booth is designed, if the, temp, the camera is vertical or the camera is horizontal, you set that there. Now down this column, if you look right here, this whole big long column, these are all the outputs. So first of all, we have the print photo and that's where you would choose the size. So um, you can choose whatever size. If you look over here and you see something like this and that doesn't look right, it's because you don't have the correct size selected. You can also choose auto and then it will base the preview photo there on the actual size that's uh, the template selected. Next we have print alternate. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about that in just a little while, maybe tomorrow in, uh, in the more advanced section. But uh, the uh, print alternate allows you to line up several templates. If you click on that, you can add templates right here. You, you click there and you can select templates to add to the, the um, selection. Those are displayed to the user and then they can choose which one they want. You can do it before the session or you can do it after the session. If you do it before the session, it uses some sample photos that we include and if you do it after the session, you, it will show you the actual photos taken. The sample photos, if you want to do it beforehand, are um, replaceable with your own if you want to. And um, pretty easy to do that. There's instructions in our knowledge base. So you can add up to 50 templates. Now, be cautious there because 50 templates is a lot to go through. And it could leave your customers um, tying up the booth for a long period of time and, and having other people waiting in line. So most people only do two or three, maybe four, but uh, you technically can do up to 50. So that's the print alternate section. Uh, the next thing is the special winner. We'll talk about that more again in another seminar, but this is where you can have a uh, random uh, winner. So you set this, you can choose how often and uh, maximum wins per hour, etc. This random winner section, you can play a video, you can have it play a sound, it can turn lights on if you're using a fidget, various things like that. So when someone is uh, doing a session, it can choose the winner and then you can give them a prize or something like that. Then we have photo email one and two. These are two different settings that do basically the same thing. When you click on that, you can set up the email account to use. If you have multiples, you can set up the prompt before or after, etc. And then you can set the file size, what's sent. Over on the top right hand of that dialog, you'll see message. And that's where you can put in whatever message you want sent with that uh, particular email. And you have an option of just regular text, or you can click here and add HTML if you, uh, if you know how to do HTML. Um, so that's where you do the photo email. There's two different options there where you can do two different ones if you want to just like blind carbon copy that to somebody. Down from that we have photo to phone. This is like a text message. The same options to set things up. If you're using Twilio, if you are using a Twilio account, this will be grayed out because it doesn't give you the option to choose. If you are not using Twilio, then it will give you the option to choose an email account to send with. If you only have one, then you won't, 
you, you won't have a choice. Uh, but you can also do that. Now, in both the photo email and the photo to phone setup, you'll notice there's an opportunity to add a border right here. That's a template. Um, that would only need to be done if you want to send a different template than what your standard output is. Okay, so only need to do that if you want to send a different template than your standard output. Uh, normally, whatever template you have selected here, or if you're using the print alternate, whatever template that they select would be the one that would be sent. Uh, but if you select the photo to phone um, or the photo email template here, then it gives you, lets you choose a different one to be sent. Uh, save output one and two, that's where you can save a flat file JPEG. If you remember, we talked about this not being a flat file. You can output those here, copy or burn is what that's called. You can output that after the session in large groups. The way that works is you can hold down your shift key and select multiples, one, or you can select all. But if you uh, want to do that in real time as it's uh, happening, as the event's going on, then in this section right here, you can use the save output one and two. Some of the same options, you can choose the file size, etc. The file type, JPEG is by far the most popular. You can choose the location. Um, most people do that to a, a file, I mean a folder on your desktop or something. You could do it to a thumb drive, however, uh, be aware that that can be slower if your thumb drive is a really slow thumb drive. It can also cause an error message if your thumb drive fills up and uh, that's not a problem. It just tells you you can't save it anymore, but if you don't know what to do and you're not expecting that, if your thumb drive gets full, uh, that can be kind of disconcerting at an event. So I recommend doing it to a folder on the desktop and then you can just copy that off after the event to a thumb drive if you want to do that. Uh, down from there, you can actually do, uh, back up a little bit, you can do two output locations if you need to. Uh, you can also use that for sharing features if you're using a third-party sharing software like a kiosk or something. Copy Originals does exactly the same thing with the same options, only Copy Originals is the actual original photos right from the camera with no change. Now if you're doing a green screen, you can also add an output template here to change the background on that green screen template, I mean on that uh, green screen photo. So if you're doing a green screen and you want to save not the green photo out, but one with a background, you can add that background there. Okay, post to Dropbox. Uh, if you want to have everything post up to Dropbox as every session it is over, all of these options along here are after each session, then that would get posted to Dropbox. So you can do that. You can choose the, the Dropbox folder, the file size. You can change the border if you want to, etc. Uh, post to Facebook. Unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, we've had a lot of difficulties with Facebook blocking those kinds of things. We've been applying and reapplying and trying to jump through all the hoops that Facebook requires to get approval to start doing that again. And thus far, we have been not successful. So uh, at this point in time, the post to Facebook is not functional. We're looking at alternatives and how we can um, maybe offer some sort of option to, to do something a little different. But right now, that's certainly not working. Uh, the same thing for user post. This is where someone could put in their own uh, username and password and post to Facebook. Uh, so that doesn't function either. Now, right now, the way we've set up post, the uh, user post, the post to Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, all of those, none of those services allow people to put in their username and password and post directly to those services. Snapchat, Instagram, none of those allow that. So what we do is if you choose Instagram, we let you send it to their phone by email or text. You can choose the file size, etc. But basically what would happen is they would get prompted to put in their phone number or their email address and they would get that sent to them as a uh, text message or an email with a link to Instagram where they can click on it and post it directly to Instagram. So we call that an Instagram, Twitter, you know, ready file, but it doesn't actually work to post it directly to those services because they don't allow that. Uh, next to the bottom down here, we have post to event gallery. Uh, Darkroom software has an event gallery service that is an extra fee. It's $30 a month. Um, you can use that for unlimited events and uh, with unlimited photo booths, depending on how many you have. But in the event gallery, you would put in your information. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit on the global settings. 
And once you put in your API key for the event gallery, then everything from the photo booth output would get posted to the event gallery. It's a great way to allow people to uh, share images through the event gallery, and it lets them do it on their own device. So you can put a QR code or some other link or something that would take them to that on their phone, and then they can email it, text it, share it, download it directly to their phone. Gives them a lot more options. Uh, we're going to be doing a more advanced or a more in-depth uh, seminar on the event gallery. Let's see, when is that? That's on Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time if you want to take part of that and learn more about how you can use event gallery. Uh, last down here at the bottom is remove.bg. This is green screenless uh, background dropout. I'll demonstrate that uh, at some point in time through this workshop. But the, uh, the uh, remove.bg allows you to drop out the background. It does require internet and it does require a remove.bg account. The way you set that up is you enable it, you set it up and put in your API key for your particular remove.bg account. And I'll do another demo on that in a little bit, but that will um, allow you to do green screen list dropout and it, it does an amazing job. Okay, let's uh, move on and talk a little bit more about a couple of other things. Uh, just if you look at all of these various controls, you, we've talked about the output tab, we have the screens tab. One of the things that really surprises me about a lot of people is they've never taken an opportunity to look around. We're trying to troubleshoot or help somebody, especially if they're in an event, and we'll say, can you go to the Live View tab? And their answer is, where's that? Well, that's right here where it says Live View. Or we'll say, can you go to the camera tab and tell me what the camera settings are? And they go there. Now I'm using a webcam, so if you were using a digital SLR, you'd see a different screen. This is dependent on what kind of camera you're using. But um, all of those things are right there so you can find what you need when a support technician asks you to go to, to a particular section in the software. So that's where all of that would be found. Let's take a second and look at print tab uh, templates. Okay, So let's go back here. If I click on this big button right here that says Choose, then you'll see all of the templates that are in this particular software. And some of these are sample templates. Some of them are my demo templates. But if I double click on this one right here, I want to open that up in the editor. This is our template editor for Darkroom. And you'll see the template. Anytime you see a big gray box with a number in it, a big white number, that is where the future photo for your session will go. Now, if the photo I'm just going to change this one right quick. So you see where it says chroma key. If I choose that, now you'll see that it's clear. It's no longer gray. You can see the background behind it. That's what a green screen template would look like. And sometimes at an event, an attendant or somebody will choose the wrong template and uh, they're getting all sorts of unpredictable results. And it's because they're not using a green screen, but they're using a template that's made for green screen. Or the opposite is true. Maybe they're trying to use a green screen, but they have a template that's not set for green screen. So if you're having you know unpredictable results with a, a, you know trying to do green screen, or maybe you're not sure if you're using a green screen template or something, look here, and if you see the background is clear, then it's uh, a green screen template. If it's not clear, if it's a gray box like that, then it is a green screen template. Okay, so down along the bottom. Here you'll see all sorts of options, edit template, uh, add photo, add photos, add artwork. So if you're going to add a logo or some other graphic, you choose add artwork. You can choose um, lots of different options here. We're going to talk about this more in depth in another, uh, you know, advanced topics about doing template um, creation and so, but I will just wanted to touch on all of those things right there. So let's back out of that. And let's move over to our, oh, once you select it here, you click choose, and that's how you would choose that. So let's go next to the screen template. Here's our screen template. It works very much the same way. You can click edit, uh, open it here. You see I've got a live view window here. Same thing, gray box indicates that it's not for green screen. If you double click on it, you can change it to for a green screen. Um, over here on the right hand side, and this is true for print templates and screen templates, you'll see all the template items. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you may be thinking uh, layers, and that works very much like layers in Photoshop. So each one of these things is a separate layer, and each one can be moved up and down in the layer hierarchy. 
hierarchy and you can also change what they do. We'll talk more about that again in a more advanced topic uh, workshop here in a day or so. But across the bottom are all the icons. Works very similar, although the screen template has a few things like the add input, um, signature, and so on that are not in the print templates. Those things don't apply to a, a, uh, a print template, so they're not there. Um, add input, just as a side note, if you're using a vertical spaced like a mirror booth or something and your keyboard is all the way at the bottom and you'd like to move it up, that's how you would do that. You click on add input and then click OK. It puts a box on the screen like that and you can move that around to wherever you want the, uh, the keyboard to appear. Okay, let me back out of that. That's our screen templates. Um, if you notice right here at the bottom corner it says save event settings. If you click right there and you click save event then it asks you if you want to do that. You click yes. Now if I take that event template and I copy that off to another computer using Darkroom Booth and open that, then when I do that it's going to pop up this prompt right here. Would you like to load the settings that are saved? And I can either do it in the current event or I can create a new event. And what that will do is let you move all the things that make up that particular event from one computer to another um, all in the single file. So it's really nice to be able to create on one computer and move it to another computer. All right, I'm going to get out of that one. Let's go back over here. Uh, in the controls tab, that's the next one up. The controls tab um, depends on you know how you're working your photo booth. If you're using a touch screen, uh, you may not need to change anything here. These top settings are how you would work with a keyboard. So if you wanted to start with the space bar or you know control um, C to change from color to black and white, those kind of things. Those are all toggles on the keyboard that you can use. The next section is um, features on a mouse where you could use the left mouse button to do a particular thing. So if I choose that, I've got all these different options that I can do on a left mouse button like start or change graphics or etc. Be aware that if you're using a touch screen, anything you set to this left mouse button will happen anytime someone touches the screen. So for example, if you want them to be able to touch anywhere on the screen, then you would set this to start session. And anywhere they touch on the screen, it would start a session. But on the other hand, if you were to set this to, uh, let's say, um, print an extra copy or reprint last, then any touch on the screen will cause the photo booth to print another copy. Uh, every once in a while, we'll get a call from somebody that's just you know at an event freaking out because of all the uh, prints that are coming out, and it's because they've set that left mouse button to uh, reprint the last or something and then every time they you know touch the screen it does that uh, the same with a right mouse button that's a touch and hold so if you touch the screen and hold it there for a second or two then whatever you're doing would happen that's set at the right the yellow the right mouse button so those are some options there now down at the bottom are some other options uh, these are probably less used one of them is face detection starts the session that's a, a cute little parlor trick, but it's not very practical to be honest with you because anytime anyone looks at the camera and it recognizes that it's a face like sees two eyes, it's going to automatically start the session. With an open photo booth, uh, that can be a really problem because all someone has to do is walk by and it'll start the session. A closed booth may have some application with that, but an open booth, it's not real practical. There's some other options there. You can take a look at those. Some of those is if you were going to use an old-fashioned serial port trigger um, like Booth's had 10 years ago that practically nobody uses anymore. Uh, down at the bottom is uh, to set up for token support if you're using a bill changer or a card acceptor. We'll talk about that in one of the advanced classes. Okay, let's go back up and let's talk about our text tab. Um, these are where you can put in text and allow the software to insert that text in a screen template. So if you have a, a screen template that you want to be able to change easily instead of having to edit the template, you can put a placeholder in the screen template and we'll cover that more with template design. But with those placeholders, you can insert this information here. So that's what that's for. 
Down toward the bottom of this screen are some other options that you can use. We'll talk about these things more later on, but like for instance, if you want to preview the GIF, if you're doing a burst mode or a regular GIF, you can check this box here. Uh, if you're doing a photo select, that's where you take say three or four photos and then let the, uh, the user uh, choose their favorite of that group. You can do that. You can you, let them sign the photo. Those are all advanced topics we'll talk about in another seminar, but that's where those are found. Okay, um, timing tab. That's just exactly what it says. If you want to have more time between photos, you can set that here. You can set the get ready delay. That's that's a little delay before the uh, the countdown starts. So you click on start. There's a you know time that people can get in position, and then the countdown three, two, one would start. So those are all things that you can change. Uh, things like how long a video is recorded and so on. Down toward the bottom are prompts. Um, for example, um, you can set how long the uh, email keyboard is on the screen. If someone walks away, you don't want it to stay in there forever. Uh, you want it to time out and go back to the start screen. So you can set all of those kinds of things right there. Okay, uh, camera tab, I mentioned that a while ago. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, we're not talking about exposure and, and camera use. Uh, again, this changes depending on what camera is connected. So if you look at this and you go, well, mine looks different, and that may be because you have a Canon or an Icon camera plugged in and not a webcam. This is what it looks like with a webcam. All right, let's uh, live view. Uh, live view lets you, if you click right here, you can see a simulated, not simulated, you can see what the camera is seeing for a live view. That's just a test. Uh, you can choose uh, when you want the live view to come on, if you want it to come on all the time, you can change that to always on. You can also change it um, to after a session is started. If you're using a digital SLR, specifically Canon, and you're using flash, then you'd want to change this to pause live view for a second or two because the uh, Canon cameras need that pause to be able to trigger a flash. I'm using a webcam, so I've got it set to continue live view without pause. Uh, this is also another place where you can set how the camera is turned. It's just a duplicate control. If you change it in one place, it changes in the other place as well. Okay, let's uh, go on. If you're doing any sort of video related features, those would be in the video tab. Uh, these are all things that we'll cover in a more advanced topic, but uh, you can add intros, outros, you can add soundtracks, uh, things like that for video. Uh, down at the bottom are the controls for burst mode. If you're doing a burst mode, which is done as a video, the burst mode, you can set the playback speed and the capture rate, etc. Okay, now let's look at slideshow. This is where the slideshow section is. If you turn on the slideshow and you just check basic, the, the default is off like this, but if you check basic, then to a secondary monitor, if you have one, it's going to display each output photo, the photo strip that's being printed. And it'll just display that on the screen every so many seconds and change that automatically. Uh, that's the basic. You click on custom, then you see a lot more options that are very powerful, honestly, and you can do a lot of really interesting things with the slideshow feature. We'll cover that in a little more detail in an advanced topic class. Uh, device control, if you're using uh, a fidget or any number of other things you can use in device control. Device control is very powerful to trigger outside software, to uh, trigger lights, sounds, videos playing, all those kinds of things. If you're doing a, uh, a mirror booth, for example, we'll talk about that more in advanced topics, but that's where you would set that all up there in the, in the device control. Um, wrap up. I want to talk a little bit about wrap up. The purpose of wrap up is so that you can save out all of the various things to do with the photo booth after the event is over. So you would basically put the path where you want to save it to your desktop, thumb drive, etc. Then you can choose, you know, copy originals, copy the output. If you're doing a survey, this is where you would output the survey results. Um, the event stats would tell you how many sessions you did, how many of them were in color, etc. Um, the email list, if you wanted to output the email or phone numbers that you could give to your client, uh, people that used the photo uh, booth, that's where you would do that. Uh, this last one down here is a generate photo booth photo book that puts out a PDF file 
depending on the size, there's, there's no options to it, no controls or anything. It just outputs a PDF file in an 8x10 format. Uh, multi-page with all of the photo strips output there. We do have some plans to add some more functionality to that, but we haven't done that yet. Once you do that, then you just select, you know, generate selected, and that will save out all of those options uh, to that location that you've specified down here. Okay, um, let's talk just briefly about global settings. If you choose global settings, going to take you to this section of the software. At the very top, you'll see application options. Uh, the very first one says PhotoPath. Folks, don't change that, please. It says before changing the PhotoPath, you should copy content such as screen and print templates to a new folder location. Um, the reason for that is this is where everything to do with Darkroom Booth is. All of your events, your templates, the photos, everything are stored on this particular location. The um, X drive is a shortcut to that. If you're mystified by the X drive, that's what this does is it lets you go to the actual location, uh, not just the, uh, the shortcut X drive. But if you change that, and we get some support calls sometimes where people go, oh, well, I think I want to save the images somewhere else. And so they click browse and they change it to their desktop or something. The problem is they didn't move their templates and now Darkroom can't find them. So if you have questions about this, the best thing to do is before you do it, contact our support staff and they can help you do that. The primary reason this is here at all is if you wanted to direct Darkroom Booth to, to a different drive, uh, you know, like you have a secondary hard drive or something like that. In most cases, you don't need to change this. You need to leave it alone. Okay. Underneath that is, a, is where you can put in a password um to unlock events so you can put in a password here when you lock events if you remember i talked about um, locking the event so people can't change it <clears throat> excuse me the uh you can put a password in there that would re request it uh, it's not foolproof somebody could go here and change it but if they just didn't know what the password was they would know that they were allowed to change that Here's another one right here, operator pin code. If you don't want people to accidentally exit out of the photo booth, you can check this right here. The default is four zeros. You can change this right here. Um, that would be where if somebody tries to exit the photo booth mode, a user or something, it's going to prompt them to put in a pin code. And then, like I said, the default is four zeros. All right, next one is application updates. When you click on application updates, then you're going to see a, um, a, uh, a list here in the software. Uh, I'm using a beta version 907. Uh, you'll see the current version that you're on. If you're talking to a support technician and they say, can you tell me what software version you're on? This is where you would find out global settings, application updates. If there were a newer version available, you'd see that listed here. Now, be aware that if you know you get one year of free updates with your software purchase, uh, at the end of that year, then um, you have to pay for those. So be aware that not all updates are free. It is never a good plan to do that just before an event. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't do it within two or three days of an event. Uh, you know, if you have an event on Saturday, don't do that beyond Wednesday or something uh, so that you have time to learn the new features, especially if it's been a year or two since you've done that. So be cautious there. Um, let's talk about automation and device control. This is a secondary place. I showed you the device control section in the event. There's two different places for a reason. This would be areas that would apply to all events. So let's say you have a green light or something on your photo booth that when someone is in a session, it shows green if they're, or it shows red. And then if they're not in a session, it shows green, meaning the booth is available. If you wanted that to apply to all events, then you would set that up here. If you want a particular thing in automation and device control to only apply to a specific event, then you would set that up within the event itself. So they look the same, but two different purposes. One is for that event only. The other one is for all events on this photo booth. Um, booth control, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in another uh, session, uh, but enabling booth control allows you to control the photo booth from your phone. And uh, they just need to be on the same Wi-Fi, and it's very powerful and gives you a lot of possibilities to uh, control the photo booth, especially in this day and age when we, uh, 
suddenly now everybody's really cautious about touching things. So if you wanted to be able to control the photo booth and not um, you know, have people touching your screen, you can do that from booth control. Booth stats is where you can find out information about your particular photo booth. It adds an awful lot of options here. Um, you can have that information sent to you by email. You can have it, uh, you know, sent um, by phone. It can done it be once a day, once an hour, uh, start of the day. Um, lots of different options there. So it's a good opportunity to find out, you know, what's going on with your booth. If you're using a built-in printer like a DNP or a Mitsubishi, it also includes uh, how much media is left in the printer. So you can get some insight there about uh, uh, remaining media without having to go stop the session and, and see. Okay, uh, email and online accounts. This is where you would set up things like I mentioned earlier, remove.bg or event gallery. When you do that, you would put in your API key. So you'd create a particular account with remove.bg. That's a website you'd go to, remove.bg, and you would get an API key and put it in right there, and that links the two. Same thing with Event Gallery. When you click on that, uh, you would go to Event Gallery, you know, to your particular account. You would get that API key and put it right here, and that links the two. We also have Twilio. That's for text messaging. In the uh, latest version of the software, this we changed about six months ago. Uh, once upon a time, you had to have uh, Dropbox be a temporary storage for Twilio. Uh, that could, was problematic, to be honest with you. Dropbox has increased their security as time went on. And so while it worked great in the beginning, it got to be very problematic. So about six months ago, we changed that. So the current version of Darkroom, uh, we have our own server built in as temporary storage. So you don't need a Dropbox account if you're using uh, with the latest version of Darkroom. You just use Twilio. Um, if you're using a version previous to that, then you do still need to use Dropbox. Uh, then here's where you would put in your email address, uh, in information there. You can put it all in and click test. And if everything's working correctly, it'll give you the outgoing message OK. There can be a variety of reasons. We'll touch on this in troubleshooting, but a variety of reasons why this may not work. It may give you an error. It could be that you're on a Wi-Fi that's blocked for email traffic. A lot of places, public venues and stuff do that to prevent spam. It could also be that you don't have a password set up correctly or something, but that just lets you know everything's working correctly. Okay. Um, the next one is printer options. You can add your printer here. If you're using a uh, printer that, um, if you click on add printer, you'll see all the built-in printer drivers, uh, DNP, Fuji, Film, uh, Mitsubishi, so on. Um, if you're not using one of those, then you click down here on Windows printer, and then you can add whatever printer you're using using the Windows driver. Um, there's a lot of advantages to the built-in drivers. We can turn the cut on and off as needed, where with the Windows driver, you would need to do that yourself uh, to set it to a two by six cut or whatever you need there. So you'd want to go over here where it says enabled and detected. Uh, you'd want to see a, a detected you know, one right there so you know that Darkroom found the printer. You can actually use more than one printer to do different sizes using alternate print. So if you're doing, you know, if you have two printers, say a, a 620, two 620s or something like that, you could have one print a six by eight and one print a four by six or a two by six. And so you can offer different sizes of prints. If you um, use two of the same printers with the same media size, then you can, Darkroom will automatically, all you have to do is add it, Darkroom will automatically uh, load balance between the two and alternate between the two printers to speed up production and, and uh, throughput on those printers. Very bottom, you see system info. System info gives a lot of information. It's also beneficial for our uh, support staff so they can see a variety of things. Uh, first of all, at the top, you'll see your license information. This is where you would deactivate this computer. If you want to move it to another computer, you would click right there and put in your user or your uh, activation code and return the license and that would remove the activation from this computer and let you move it to another computer. Uh, this is where your maintenance plan would be listed. This is how long your uh, 
software has the free update period. If your maintenance plan has expired, it does not mean your software stops working. It just means you can't install a newer version without paying for an update. So uh, don't look at that and say, oh, it, it expired last month or, or it's going to expire next month. doesn't mean your software will quit working. The version you have installed on there will continue to work as long as needed. Uh, this is where Windows you know, version is displayed. That's in many cases for support. This gives us lots of information about what system equipment you have and so on. Okay. All right. Let's go back up here and go back to the main section. I want to show you one more thing um, in, uh, in Darkroom about um, the, um, the way you can use event management. Let's go to the output section. If you double click on the, uh, the event name, you'll see at the top, you'll see the event name and the date. Okay. Then you'll see a description and a notes. Now, if, it, if you look down here and I know the screen, the text is pretty tiny, but you can look in your own software. You'll see display these fields in screen and print templates using special text. So if you add this information, like for example, print or parentheses, event parentheses, to a screen or print template, then it will display, display the information right here in this name field. The same thing for event description and so on. So if you look right here, you'll see that under event description, I've put Josh and Andrea. Under notes, I've put March 22nd, 2021. Now here's where that becomes beneficial. If you create your templates, your screen and print templates in a generic fashion, if you look right here, this one on the screen, you'll see it says Josh and Andrea, March 22nd, 2021. If I double click on that and I open that particular template in my editor, let me find it real quick. Here we go. Oops. Okay. So if I open that in my editor and you see this information right here, if I double click on that, you'll see it's actually a placeholder that says parentheses, event description, parentheses. And the same thing for the date. It says event, note, or parentheses, or not parentheses, um, percent sign, event note, percent sign. Now what that does for you, if you create all your templates in this generic fashion, then that lets you, without editing the template, insert that information in the, um, the final output. And so if you look here, this is where we see Josh and Andrea and so on. So now let me show you this. If I go here and let's say I change that to 2020, okay? Now you'll see that that information changes here in the print template 2020. So you can see that allows you to change that information easily. Now, where does that become beneficial to you? Everybody that's been in this business very long has at least one time or another spelled something wrong on the print or the um, date, had the date wrong. Everybody's done it at least once. I've done it once. Uh, years ago when I was new in this business. So everybody's done it at least once. Now Darkroom allows you a number of ways to correct that. Um, by far the simplest and easiest. You can use the wrap up tab to create a new template, output your images to that. You can do a lot of different things, but by far the simplest is by using this method. So then all you have to do is go here and correct that. Then when you go here, now you'll see the preview still shows the old date, but if I double click on that, it updated and you see the corrected date. Okay. So now you see that corrected date. So if I go here and I output this, uh, either through a print or whatever, it's going to have the corrected date the same thing with the name or anything. So that gives you a great opportunity to make a correction quickly and easily without having to uh, do a whole lot of work. You just simply go here in the um, this area and change this. Now, uh, the reason I used the uh, description and the notes is because you may want, in this case, the name that's shown in the 
uh, events list to be different than what actually gets printed on the strip. You could actually just put it up here or you could do the date here. Now, if you use the um, event date, it puts this date, but it does it in a um, the, the number format, not the printed out format. So this way, using the description in the notes field, you can change however you want that to look. You could type it in any format you want, text or whatever. Hope that makes sense to everybody. Now then, I want to take a second and um, talk a little bit about cameras and camera exposures and so on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint and in this PowerPoint we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about cameras and so on. So let's start here. Okay. There's two different kinds of cameras that Darkroom can use. The one on the left you'll see in that picture is a webcam. That's just a generic, you know, just a Logitech webcam. And then on the right hand we have a Canon camera. As I mentioned earlier, in the camera tab, depending on what kind of camera you have in there, it will display differently. For example, if you're using an older camera that doesn't do video, then you won't see, like for example, with a Canon, let's say a 40D, that doesn't do video, so you won't see new video options. But if you're using a T6i that does do video, then you'll see video options. So that's a, a difference there. Now, if you uh, follow along with me here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the various things. Uh, one of the characteristics of a webcam is they're easy to use. That you just plug them in and, and they're there and, and there's no setting of exposure or anything. It's just pretty easy to use. Uh, they're powered by the computer so you don't have to worry about a separate power supply or anything like that. They're powered off the USB of the computer so that's a great advantage. Uh, it could be useful if for whatever reason you're doing a photo booth in a uh, fixed location that you're not going to have an attendant at. A webcam might be a better choice than a digital SLR. Uh, the downside is you have limited to no control over exposure and uh, angle of view and things like that uh, because those cameras, uh, they're actually like a, a video camera. They're just grabbing a still frame from the, the video type camera. So you have limited control over that. Um, they only use constant light. You can't use flash. So that's uh, another characteristic of a webcam. Uh, you get good image quality, but a lot of them, you know, with a photo booth, you're not making a 16 by 20, you're making typically a really small size print. So you do get good image quality if you have good lighting. That's the big key right there is you want to have good quality lighting. Now, um, I do recommend that for troubleshooting purposes, if you cannot afford to have a second digital SLR, if you're using a digital SLR, if you can't afford to have a second one, get you an inexpensive webcam. They're generally under $100 for a nice one. And you can learn how to use that with available light uh, using maybe your uh, flash uh, uh, modeling light or something. Learn how to use it so if you have a problem with your main camera then you can switch to a digital or to a, a webcam quickly and easily. Alright, they are low cost so generally under a hundred dollars. Alright, let's talk about digital SLRs for a second. They're more complicated to use. Um, they do have more settings. Uh, you can zoom the lens and so that's an advantage and you can adjust the exposure and get a better control over your lighting and everything but they are more complicated to use and require some learning. Um, they do require a separate power supply. I do recommend people use an AC type power supply, a battery replacement of some kind. You can use a battery but the batteries will have a limited lifespan especially if you're using the uh, live view for very long. So uh, I definitely think you should use a, uh, most people use a, a power supply of some kind that is not battery. Uh, you can use auto exposure with uh, com you know, regular uh, available light or you have full manual control if you want to use an external flash. You will get superior quality with a digital SLR and, a, and a, uh, an umbrella or something along with um, a flash than you will with a webcam. That's just a fact. Uh, constant light or electronic flash, I mentioned that earlier, you have a choice of either one of those. So um, my choice as an old photographer would always be electronic flash to get superior quality. They are a higher cost, which is why I recommend if you cannot afford a second one as a backup, you get an inexpensive webcam to use as a backup so that you have a backup with you. Uh, you get greater image quality over a wider range of uh, situations. 
so you can you can get by with less light and, and various things like that you also have the ability to zoom uh, that you don't necessarily have with a webcam uh, you have total control if you know what you're doing with white balance exposure focus this is by far the better way if you're going to do much green screen is being able to control all of those things all right so let's uh that's a, uh, a canon t6i this is the top view where you'd see the dial on top now this dial on top the only thing that you cannot set within the software uh, is there's two things one of those things is turning on autofocus or off autofocus so if you can see my mouse pointer the autofocus switch is right actually it's down here a little bit lower you can't see it um, but right in this area here on the left side of the lens that's manual or autofocus the other thing you cannot turn off within the software is turning this dial right here this is the exposure mode most cases you only want to use P or M there's not really a prevailing reason to use any of those other settings and in some cases like for instance the sports setting that turns off the live view so you if you you know trying to use it and everything works but there's no live view it could be because you've got it set on the um, the, the sports setting or something so M or P P is automatic it stands for program the camera would choose all of the various settings uh, for exposure and everything uh, no control over that you just set it to P and it does its thing M gives you complete control now that means you have to control it so keep in mind you're talking about two different things exposure control manual control many or uh, manual focus and autofocus a lot of times people get those confused and they'll say well it is on manual but they're talking about exposure not autofocus or autofocus not manual uh, exposure so two different settings there you want to be aware of both of those things all right let's move to the next one now I wanted to take just a second and talk to you about the design of a digital SLR there's a lot of people that misunderstand that they talk about the sounds they hear and the, it, it, I hear the shutter but it doesn't take the picture till a few minutes later or a few seconds later uh, what they're actually hearing is the mirror so this is a cutaway whoops let me go back this is a cutaway of a digital SLR so you'll see right here with my mouse pointer this is the lens where the light comes in back here this blue area this is the the imaging sensor where the film would have been in a film camera but the imaging sensor then you have this mirror right here this mirror moves up and down and that's how you see it through the viewfinder so the image comes in it hits the mirror it goes up into this prism which reflects it back out into the viewfinder and that's how you see it through the viewfinder for a photo booth you're not really using the viewfinder but you still want to be able to access the live view so to access the live view the uh, camera brings that mirror back up out of the way so that it can go through to the imaging sensor so the shutter opens now here's what happens when you uh, go to, to take a picture so you start off like this the mirror goes up and it goes into live view people get in position they get ready to take their picture and then just before the exposure happens the mirror goes down the shutter closes the mirror goes back up and the shutter opens and takes the picture and then repeats the process whoops so all of those things are what you're hearing that noise and stuff inside there now if you're using a mirror less a mirror less camera like the uh, Canon M50 then this mirror there's no mirror it's just going to the the imaging sensor uh, in this sort of a fashion here but no mirror at all and um, the shutter is still opening and closing so you're hearing that and there's still a slight delay when that happens but um, there's no mirror to move up and down so you do hear less and have slightly less delay let's talk about autofocus um, if you look at this picture picture here this is my simulated view through the uh, the lens of the camera the little red squares represent autofocus sensors now most modern digital SLRs have several different ways you can set that the best thing to do is without the camera connected to your camera look through the viewfinder and touch the shutter button you don't have to push it all the way down but just touch it so that it uh, activates the autofocus and you'll see these little things light up and they may flicker and jump around but what you want to see whoops what you want to see is all of them you want to see all of those light up at some point what that's doing is it's allowing the camera to look for what to focus on 
If you only have one, and it is possible in most digital SLRs to select a single autofocus point, and that autofocus point can get moved around to different ones. So if you only have one enabled, like for instance under uh, the arm of our subject on the left there, then it's only hitting the background and it may have trouble focusing. So if you're using your you know, camera in autofocus and it's having trouble focusing, unplug it from the software, look through the viewfinder, push the, the uh, shutter release down part of the way and see if all of those are lighting up. You'll have to consult your particular manual to find out how to get that set back to where they're all being used because it varies with the camera and the brand. Um, so that's something you want to think of. But if it's, uh, if it's only lighting up one of them every time, then that's the problem. You may need to get that turned back over to all autofocus points. Okay, just a little brief talk about uh, shutter speed and f-stop. It's called aperture value and time value now. I'm an old guy, old photographer. So these are the three things that affect your exposure if you're using manual. Across the top row, you'll see 1.4, f2, f2.8, and so on. That's the uh, aperture. And if you'll notice the hole, the opening in the lens gets smaller the higher the number. I won't go into why, that's a, a big mathematical equation, but uh, basically the smaller the number, the more light that lets into the lens, and the larger the number, in this case on the right hand side F32, the smaller the number. Um, so in most cases you're probably going to use uh, the ones in the middle. If you're using electronic flash, probably somewhere around 8 or 11. Um, your mileage may vary. If you ask a dozen photographers that question, they're going to give you, you know, 15 different answers as to what's appropriate. Now, if you look down one more, you'll see the uh, the app or the uh, time value. This is the shutter speed, as we used to call it when I was involved in all this. Most of the time, if you're using flash, you want to stay somewhere around 1 25th, 1 100th of a second, something like that. That's a good shutter speed that will keep your subject sharp and not let it blur. The actual exposure is coming from the flash, so it's not relevant as far as that goes, but you want to use something around 1 100th one of a second, uh, slightly smaller, uh, slightly less, or slightly more. Most cameras don't sync above 1 uh, 200th of a second with a flash, so you probably would never want to go anything higher than that, but in most cases 1 100th of a second is just right. If you notice with a webcam, the exposures, depending on the amount of light, can get down here in 1 30th, 1 15th, and so on. So you'll see here that it's blurring. So if you look at your uh, images and they're all motion blurred, not focus blurred, but motion blurred, that's what this is. The, the aperture, I mean, the shutter speed is too slow, and so the um, images are getting blurred. At the bottom you see uh, the ISO, that's how sensitive the imaging chip is to light. If you're using an, an electronic flash, an external flash, probably somewhere around 100 to 200 is appropriate. You may, you know, depending on the circumstances, use 400. It's up to you, uh, but I doubt you would ever use anything higher than that with an electronic flash. With uh, available light, yes, it's very possible you might go 800 or 1600. The image quality will degrade slightly when you go higher, but up to 3200 with a photo booth, you're not likely to see much difference. Um, uh, you know, it only would show when you started getting to a 16 by 20 or a larger image, so that's typically not a problem. Now. Um, this is uh, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, a big number, f11 in this case, or an aperture, lets in less light, the image will be darker. Uh, if you have a small number, it lets in more light. So if you're taking pictures and doing your test photos with your electronic flash, and let's say you're using f11, then the pictures are too dark, then you either use, use a smaller number, f8 in this case would be the next step up, or turn your flash up, okay? All right, here's what it looks like when you plug a T6i. This is uh, the various settings for a T6i. Uh, your you know, camera may be different, may appear differently, but in this case, if you look at number one, that's uh, the uh, manual 
exposure in this particular case. That's that top dial on the camera that I was talking about that cannot be changed within the software. So all we're doing here is displaying what mode it is actually in. If for whatever reason you're having problems with your exposure and you're using an external flash, that needs to be on M. You want to look at the, um, the, the settings here. And if it's not on M, then you need to change that so that you'll get back to the correct exposure. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next one down is the AV. That's the aperture value I was talking about. For electronic flash, these are the settings that I would start off with. Um, use manual. Use <coughs> the uh, aperture value at f8. The time value at 1 100th of a second. Start the ISO with 100. You can go up if your picture is a little bit too dark. Um, but 100 should be pretty good for most electronic flash units. <coughs> You also want to consider the white balance. If you're using electronic flash, uh, there's usually a flash or a daylight setting that would be appropriate. Uh, you could also put it on auto. The problem with auto is it can affect the images, uh, the slight, the color of the images based on what people are wearing, which can be problematic with green screen. So if you're doing green screen, especially, you want to make sure they are consistently the same color every time. So I would set that to daylight or to flash. Uh, you can also, um, you know, like I said, you can use auto, but if you, if you look at your photos, they can vary depending on whether somebody's wearing red or blue or whatever. Okay, so let's move to the next one. So this is the back of a uh, Alien B. Alien B is a real common popular flash unit. If you uh, have something else, uh, they're going to have similar settings to this, um, but this is, uh, this is an Alien B. If you are looking for a good quality flash. Alien B is an excellent one to use. They're reasonably priced. Um, this particular model here, I think, is around $230 or $40. Um, it's also very durable. I personally, as a photographer, have their White Lightning series. Same company makes it. I bought them over 25 years ago. They still work just like the day I bought them and uh, are still you know, chugging along. So uh, they are very durable and will, uh, will last a long time. The uh, little slide across the top where you see F32, F16, etc. that is the uh, flash power. Uh, what I would do is I would use these previous settings that I had right there. So if you start with those settings right there using an external flash, start with M, F8, 100th of a second, and ISO 100. Set this on about half. Then, if your pictures are, you know, way too dark, you can go to ISO 200. If they're just a little too dark, you can bump the power up. If you're, you know, if they're too bright, you can bump the power down. But use this uh, little slide on the back of your flash to adjust the power output to get correct exposure. Exposure will vary. There is no one perfect setting. If, if it was, there wouldn't have all those dials on there. So exposure will vary depending on a lot of different things, how far your subject is away, what kind of uh, you know umbrella you're using or other diffuser, if you're doing shoot through versus reflected, if you have a low ceiling that's white versus a high ceiling that's black, all of those things can affect exposure. So it's a good idea to play with that. Set it up in your house uh, before you go to an event, you know, and just adjust it and see what those things do when you change something so that when you're at the event, you know what to do to get the proper color and the, and the proper exposure. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. If you're using a Canon flash, you want to check external flash compensation. That will make sure your uh, live view is uh, bright. So if you're using a Canon camera with an external flash, let me rephrase that. Two things you want to set. One of those is check this box for external flash compensation. The other one is set your live view to pause for at least one second. Um, Nikons, on the other hand, they don't let you change the setting so that it doesn't show up if you're using an icon. It only shows up if you're using Canon. Okay, this is a typical lighting setup that I would use for a photo booth, a green screen or not. This is a, a, a very good you know, way of doing it. Uh, there are any number of ways you can do it with multiple lighting and everything like that, but in a photo booth world where you're dealing with a lot of people and moving people in and out quickly, I would want to minimize the number and amount of lights and cables and cords in the way. So I would use a single light. 
I would put it directly centered over the camera. I would put it slightly above the camera, a couple of feet or so, um, so that it's uh, providing complete and even illumination. You want to put your subject somewhat slightly distant from the background if you have room, a couple of feet at least, three or four feet would be even better, especially if you're using green screen because that allows the um, the light to wrap around the subject and evenly light the background so you'll get better quality light. In this particular case, uh, this has got an umbrella. Umbrellas are relatively inexpensive. They're compact, easy to transport, um, not real expensive, so I would use umbrellas. There's also soft boxes and a lot of other opportunity or uh, possible things out there as well. Uh, I prefer umbrellas just because of their compactness and their inexpense. Uh, an umbrella, you can get certainly less than $50. And uh, sometimes they, you know, they have been known to get broken easily too, just like any other umbrella. So you might want to have a couple of spares or something like that. Okay, that's... Um, Let's move back to darkroom now. Uh, that uh, covers most everything that we've talked about for this particular session. Uh, we're going to have another session later today about uh, iPads, and then we'll move on with other things tomorrow. You can certainly tune in anytime and, uh, and uh, select the uh, topics that you'd like. For those of you who were not able to watch this live, they will be available on uh, the uh, YouTube channel later. And so we'll have those available for you there as well. Have a great day. Uh, stay safe.